Yeah, so I see kind of what I expected, and that's why I'm bothered to do this. Um, so maybe just go around the table. Has anybody got um, rethinking installed and working, or are you still having issues? Uh, it's working for me. I was able to create the the DAG. Okay. Um, but that's as, as far as I've gotten. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go through the actual, um, just running the, the scripts. Uh, I just wanted to check. Flavia, Reina, have you tried to get it going or? I just tried just now and I have the same issue as Reina. It says that I don't have the package installed called rethinking, but I installed it. But I guess I it doesn't work. I don't know. Yeah, I'm having the same issue. Okay. Um, so prob probably best to start out if one of you can share your screen because and I'll I'm gonna meanwhile I'll have in background here the instructions for installation to just to make sure. Um, because it it'll probably come down to something it's saying when you're trying to install it, but let let's go through it and and we'll because it's it's just it's weird as you can tell relative to the usual you know you find the package you install it you're ready to go kind of thing that's been the deal so far with us so yeah and i i wouldn't actually put it in a script <laughs> unlike everything else we've done um so the the way to do it and we we can just do that. Just give me one sec here. I just gotta. Is is uh, as as you might know already um, with R, you can r run commands down in the lower left in the so-called console, and um, that's where I would kind of and in getting rethinking installed. That's that's where I would do it, and the, and the. The sequence, yeah, it looks like you're you're getting the sequence working. Okay, so enter. So, <laughs> what did you answer to that one? Because you did it really quickly. <laughs> oh, it asked me to restart R before continuing on to the for the rethinking. Okay. So let's. Uh, Let's just look at what it did. Yeah, if you could just pull up the console, give it a bit more space. I just want to, okay. And just kind of scroll it up. So oh, this way? Yeah, just so, so I can see if you got any kind of bad messages keep going okay so now go over to the the lower right and hit the packages tab the lower right yeah and just look for rethinking Yeah, it's not there. Okay. Um, but the R stand is. Yeah, there. so so I think. Okay, okay. Um, just give me one sec. I think I know what's. Yeah, I told the person at Toyota, look, I've got this class at two. So, um, oh, she could have done well before then. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, one of, and one of those kind of weird. All right. Okay. 
who I'm not seeing the line. Maybe you did it and I missed it. But do you have the dev tools install underscore GitHub or McElroy three thinking? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, so just copy that line 22. Yeah. Just and that can... line okay. and paste it down below. Sure. And hit return. Yeah. It's... So this is what I keep getting. It's like, it says, would you like to update them? And then I've just been putting one and to update all of them. Um, and then I think that's where the issue is coming in because when I do that, it says some of the packages aren't available. Okay. So, this one. so error not available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So paste that line again. Okay. Because we're going to, okay, hit return. And this time, say three, none. Okay. Oh, shit. I think I might have just done something that made my code work. Uh, in the packages, it, I clicked R stan. I didn't get like. Oh, okay. Okay. I clicked R stan. I just ran my code and it seems to work. So. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm, yep. You just clicked it here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, don't click the name. Click the checkbox beside it. That's the equivalent of saying library R stan. Okay. The checkbox. Oh, okay. The left of it. Yeah. Okay, um, paste that line again, 22. <laughs> oh God, say three. Yeah, because it says removing rethinking. Every time it says it's not available, it just removes it. Okay, go over to, I don't know what the hell's going on. Go over to packages and uh, hit install. The button at the top there, yeah. just left of, yeah. And just type in CMD. Now, nah, shoot. S T A N R. It's not. It's not going to be there. No. Uh, so. Oh. Did you did you go through the installation of R Stan, Reina? Yeah, I did everything. I, and, I put it up here, but if you want, I can try again. But I did, the, I even updated our. Yeah, I yeah, was, but no. Um, so, so you do have our stand installed? Yes. Okay. Wow. Ah. And it seems to work like it's it's there um, under the packages. So it's yeah. just me thinking that's not working for some reason. Yeah, now that I'm trying all the other codes, it's I have okay. I still have this. Yeah. OK, so um, I think I know the problem. So our stand is more than a package in in R. Um, and that's why you see that second, I guess, 
if you look at the installing the rethinking our package in yeah. Uh, yeah so it says you should install our stand first navigate your internet browser to mc-stand.org and follow the instructions so did you do that yes and that's what's here so i did the r tools to get the cran yep. or cc c++ i did that first and then i installed the r stand I followed all the steps, but it's still not working. I don't know. Yeah, but so you're installing our stand. Okay, I'm gonna. Did Flavia? Did you get it to work too, or? Uh, like no. It? Like it works when I click our stand for some of the uh codes, but then when it comes to like the rethinking part the codes yeah. that require yeah so yeah, same yeah so what's happening is um because McElwraith has little scripts inside among other things inside that rethinking package that's kind of what a package is it, you know just like the other ones we've used so it's got functions and scripts and stuff like that so i don't know what the heck so and and Emily, you said that like basically you ran the DAG script, right? So the rethinking package seems to be installed in your case. Yeah. Um I went to the the website to install it and I used like a an installer. Yeah. Uh, that, well, that, that's what I'm worried about because um that's what I did. Yeah. Uh, so you will need to install both a C++ compiler and the R stand package. So, and I don't know, like the C++ compiler is not in the script, in Raina's script that we're looking at right now. That That's not yeah. covered? I did it here. So it's this website. I can okay. Yeah, website. but, but, the CRAN website is where packages are. That's where the R stand package is. But the, okay, I'll just shut up. Well, <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Um, I no, just I want to use this the R tools for your green installer, and it has the C plus plus on it. Okay, so. Reina, Flavia, are you are you both using? I forget. Is are you? Do you have PCs or Macs or what are you using? Macs. I'm using PC. <laughs> and and Emily, you're. Uh, I'm a PC. Okay. Ugh. Okay, um, you know what, we're going to start again. So um, what I want you to do, Reina, is is like get, get like go to the mcstand.org website outside of R, just like. Okay. So like the, the website that he talks about there, the mc-stand.org, okay. That's, yeah, I just went to the quick start. Okay. Where I just was, but I can stay on here. Is no, there... Okay. Yeah, you're doing everything that I did. That's a, it's maddening about this. I'm sorry. No, it's not your fault, geez. I tried, like, uninstalling it, like, reinstalling it, updating R, and using, like, the old version, the new version for, like, the last three hours, and it's still, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. See, I originally got the same error message, mm -hmm. um, and then I had to install the CMD stand R on its own. 
and then I had to install. Where, where did what you get that? that? Yeah, where did you get that, Emily? Uh, it was in the the R code that you sent in the web shares. I put it in the chat, the line oh. that I ran. Okay, let me. Um, this. Yeah, it's like install, install packages. And then, okay. yeah, I can try it. Thank you. Um, let's just put it down. Actually, I, you said put it in the console, right? Uh, it, well, either, either way, it's just, it's executing lines from the script. If you do it that way, it's the same, same difference. So, but uh, okay. sorry, Emily, you, you, um, <laughs> in installing CMD, like command, our stand? Yeah, I had to install, like, cause I had the same issue that I had followed the instructions and then tried to run the DAG script. And it said that rethinking wasn't installed. Um, and in the codes for lab four, there's one that's installing rethinking and then three or four lines down, it's the install uh, CMDR stan, and then to try rerunning it again. So I may, I may have, uh, can, maybe Emily, could you share your screen? Cause I may <laughs> have uh, nuked that script from the Folder. Like, you know, the reason I I want to get this is because actually running the scripts is like trivial. It'll take you five seconds, but mm -hmm. getting there. This is okay. What I did. So I installed, I went through it as a C. Okay. Install RStan, CM and DR, and then I installed the rest of the the tools that way. Okay, so um, what I want you to do, I I think, oh, that's and that's what you got here. I, I just looked at the chat room. So, is is the code that you've got in the chat room what we're looking at right now? Then, yeah, that's this line here. So why don't you, I, I think, it, can you, can you send a file in Zoom now? I can't remember now. Uh, of this script? Yeah. Maybe, I might have yeah, to you stop can. share. You can just um, attach it to the chat, it'll work. Okay, just sweep over the whole thing and make it a chat comment. I, what I want to do is get Reina and Flavia to copy this into a, a fresh script and, and try to run it. Do you want it just as a file or as a, a comment? Just copy, yeah, copy and paste it in as a comment. So, can, Reina, can you try, Reina and Flavia, if you could, can you sweep over that and, and copy it? I think, yeah, I think it's possible. No, it won't, it won't let me copy. Yeah. I think you actually have to attach the file. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll attach the file. Thank you. And Omar, I don't know if you've got to this, but if you if you try this, what we're trying to do is get kind of the tools you need to do Lab Four working. Uh, perfect. Okay. So I can just hit download. And what I'll do is download it into like the lab four folder. Do you want me to stop uh, sharing so somebody else can see if it works? 
Yeah, maybe um, stop and then um, Raina, if you could share again and we could see if this is going to work with yours. Oh, no worries. I'm just trying to. Um, to be okay, I'll push yes. Oh. Okay. Um, That's not good. Just start a new session. It, it'll still have that file there if you save it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I thought I was going to lose everything. All right. <laughs> Let's try this again. Uh, that's not maybe, it. <laughs> oh, maybe if I clear this, it'll help. In my workspace. Just say no. <laughs> okay. Uh, what happened? It's loading. It's still running. Okay. This is promising. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Okay. Mm, this is the rethinking part. See. Interesting. Okay, so it did that again. Okay, but I mean none. What what did you say in answer to this one, Emily? Uh I said one install all packages. Okay, so say one. Ah, it's still not available. Look. The CMD span R is still. Okay, I'm gonna, just a sec. Screen. Okay, but it still says it's installing rethinking, so. Okay, well. Be good. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's check. Uh, I'll just check the DAG one. Um, we have something, but I don't think that's what Emily's looks like. Uh, Emily, did you have your own data? Is that why? Yeah, I made my own one. Okay, I just but found, I just Googled the problem, and this is a way that People have had trouble installing command stan r, and so there, here's another GitHub place where command stan r, stan r is that I just put in the chat room. But I forgot you can't you can't copy a chat, right? Right. Um, <laughs> it looks like this worked though. Oh, it worked. So. Thank did, you so much. Did, did um, you get a DAG? Sort of. I mean. Oh, that's, that's it. Yes. Okay. That's, it. <laughs> that's good. Thank you so much for your help, Emily. Really appreciate it. No problem. Flavia, did you do the same thing? Or you can do the same yeah. thing. While... Okay. Um, yeah, it works. Yay. It works. There was just like one code that said something didn't work but i i lost it okay so because i started going through everything but i'll let you know if i come across that again okay but so i i did put uh emily's thing so i'm gonna start sharing now um okay. I'll stop and, uh, i put i put emily's code and i'll show you the lab for because I, I basically want to in the next hour <laughs> max i want to go through the whole sequence of what you have to do, but I'll show you that I put Emily's code in the lab for folder. So you'll have that 
for those of you, you know, there's obviously people who aren't here who will need it or listening to this compelling recording. Okay, so let me get my R going. Yeah, you noticed what I did, and you, you've probably all already done this. If you look in the background there, I just say, command stand are not installing, and you immediately get a bunch of people who've been trying to do it and solutions that they come up with. Um, that's not a guarantee of a quick fix, because I've been down that rabbit hole for many hours for different issues. But anyway, okay. So where am I? I'm just going to close everything and go into the lab four folder. And so you can see it's, it's different. I don't know when you maybe downloaded stuff, but it's a little bit different as of yesterday, I guess. Well, as of a few minutes ago, since I, I dropped Emily's script in there as well. Um, but again, I'm just going to take you quickly through because the lab Really, you just have to do two things in the lab. One is draw a DAG. And the DAG is just, a, it's like a crappy <laughs> conceptual model. So it's not, it's not a very slick um, graphical package or anything like that. But it's just one of the things McElwraith did to kind of match with the building the Bayesian models. So you got to draw the DAG and, and, Three of you have already done that just by getting getting the tools working. Um, and then you have to build a couple of models. So let me take you through that. Remember that um, in my case, what what you see as an example here is the simulated stream data that I was talking about in the lecture a week or so ago. And um, so you don't have to worry about that. I just want to quickly run it so you kind of see how it works um, again for 30 seconds. So remember, this is a bunch of streams. They're from two different eco regions. They're from uh, a whole range of catchment areas, you know, the, the area of land that's draining into the stream. And you can see in the first uh, lines four to nine here, I'm creating this set. It's like a set of conditions waiting to get simulated data put in. So I've got farming activity varying from one to a hundred, just a kind of an index of farming activity that I have. Um, I've got eco regions, either eco region one or two, and I've got um, catchment areas. That's line six varying from 100 to 1,000 hectares. So that's the grid. And then um, I create this data set of all those combinations. I haven't put any biological data in. All I have in it is species richness for all those combos and um, MDS scores. Remember NMDS, which everybody's done, that's just two observations are close together if they have a similar biological community and they're far apart if they're su super different. So I'm still getting things ready. And line 13 there is just, um, if it's eco region one, farming activity is less than 50s. So eco region one, which is kind of the uplands, crappy farmland, there's not as much farming activity there. So I'm building that into the simulation, okay. So um, the business end of the simulation is here between lines 19 and 36. And all that's doing is saying, forget about all the details. It's, it's for each observation it's saying, okay, you're in a given eco region, you have a given catchment area, and um, you have a given amount of farming activity that's going to cause a certain value with some variability built in because it's a simulation that's going to cause a certain value of the species richness okay so i'm kind of 
forcing it, like any good simulation, I'm forcing the ecoregions to be different by a certain amount in species richness. Upland has fewer species than the valley. And I'm forcing bigger catchments to have more species than smaller catchments. And farming activity, it actually uh, increases richness in the uplands because you add some nutrients to those uplands, you get more species and it decreases richness in the in the valley. So all that wonderful stuff I built in there, basically I'm doing that with simulated data so you can see how well or poorly your techniques to detect stuff like that um, work. And then all I do next in the in this simulation thing is just like everybody else has done, labeling variables and and you know I got factors. Uh, the ecoregions are are factors and and stuff like that. And then I save the the R data set. So I'll just run that quickly. It creates this um, this file of nine hundred twenty five observations. See how easy it didn't have to do any field work at all. Um, and here's what the data set looks like. So we got all those, you know, eco region combinations and catchment area and farming activity and log of catchment area because I use that in the modeling and those other things you don't have to worry about. And then species richness and then the log of species richness. So there's my data set almost all ready to go. And then the only other thing I do is, um, as I've seen, I generate ordination scores I gen for each combination. So, so it just takes that data set and adds a couple of ordination scores. And so this is in lieu of, I don't actually simulate every member of the community. Like there's this many mayflies, this many stoneflies and so on. I just use that ordination score to say, okay, here's, how similar these two communities are versus these two. And there's a certain effect of ecoregion and farming and all that good stuff on the, think of it as a measure of community composition. Who is there in terms of invertebrates in the stream? So if I run that, I end up with a, a data set that has, I'll just find it here quickly. And then we'll actually get to the DAG in the model, don't worry, <laughs> which is what you guys have to do. So the the data set, which is, uh, it's called Sim Streams. You can see down the lower right corner that where I've saved it, it's called Sim Streams with NMDS gradstats.rds. So that's a data set that has, still has 925 observations, all those combinations. Oh. Pick the wrong one. Um, it has 925 observations, all the combinations of catchment area and ecoregion and all that. And then at the end, there's NMDS scores and, and standardized NMDS scores, the, the ZMDS, NMDS1 and ZN, NMDS2. They're just standardized to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, so that's my data set. So I'm at now at the point where you know you've got your approved data in lab one. And before I do any Bayesian fitting and all that wonderful stuff, I'll have a look at the data set. So I've got something in here, and you don't have to do this for the lab, obviously, but just to kind of see what's going on, I've got this script called descriptive plots. So let me put that up. And that's just taking that data set, and I, I forget what plots I do. I'll just I'll just run it and see what happens. Beautiful. Wow. I would probably get like an A minus for that. So there's the there's the NMDS plot, the ordination, and you can see the two eagle regions have different colors. And oh, gee. I think the community composition is different in the highlands than it is in the lowlands. That's interesting. And then if I, I'll just go backwards here. So the plots that I made. So you see farming activity on the x-axis. Note that in the highlands, as I simulated, there's only farming activity going up to level 50 or below level 50. And then in the lowlands, it stretches from not much farming activity all the way up to 100. 
And then on the y-axis, you've got species richness. So you can see there that the, the lowlands have higher species richness. There's variability uh, at each level of farming activity. Um, and um, the, it has higher species richness than, than the highlands, which is, you know, same thing we see in real life. And then this is showing you catchment area. Remember I said that, you know, the bigger the catchment area, you usually get more species in a stream. So catchment areas on the x-axis, you got highlands are in whatever color that is, uh, the brownie kind of color. So it looks like their the species richness is going up in the highlands as you, as you um, get bigger catchment areas. But much more gently than with the lowlands where it's going up. And I, of course, I, I simulated things to be that way because I wanted a fairly complicated but and kind of realistic situation in the data, okay? And, and just to look at a couple of things that are obvious by now, um, remember I'm going backwards in the plots. So highland uh, ecoregion has lower species richness than, uh, Lowland and um, highland ecoregion has lower farming activity than lowland, and I think that's all the plots. Okay, so that's that's me getting familiar with my data set. Now I'm familiar with it, so I'm going to do some modeling. Okay, okay, so um, DAGs. Let me try to do it. Watch my DAG will not work today, <laughs> just to pay me back for causing you all that agony. So there's a DAG, and what do we got in here? The key things are, um, remember a DAG, I was telling you that the things that I think are cool about rethinking are two things, the Bayesian thing, which we'll do in a minute, and then the cause thing. And DAGs are really just forcing you to confront cause directly. And we're not gonna worry about, you know, all those, types of confounding that I was talking about uh, in the lecture, but really we just want to draw a picture of what we're proposing causes, in this case, species richness. So if I run this DAG, I'll show you the, the gory details in a sec in the, in the script. Then I get this picture, which I think most everybody's able to do now. And it's quite simple. It's just showing catchment area, is causing, to some extent, species richness. And if you look at the DAG itself, where that's, where I'm specifying that is with this DAGity function. So you, you see the DAG in quotes, so that's just the syntax. So you would, if you decided you were gonna model one of your quantitative variables as a response variable, you would put that variable name where you see SPP there. And the quantitative predictor of that, or one of the predictors of that would be where you see CA. So the, all I'm doing in line six is specifying my model. There's no data here. I guess that's important to point out. So I could put, you know, Bob and, um, Bob, uh, this is really just to draw this diagram, right? So let's see if this actually works. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, so all you have to do, I think I asked, somebody maybe look at the lab while I, while I uh, rattle away, but I think I asked you for one quantitative and one categorical predictor of your of your response variable. And I'll show you that in a sec, but all you're doing with the DAG is drawing a picture of what you think the causal relationships are here. And in this case, causal, causal relationship, simple. It's, I think, I screwed that up somehow. Oh, I've still got Bob there. I think um, catchment area, why am I? 
but I don't know why we still got Bob there. There we go. Okay, so I think catchment area causes species richness. So if we look at another DAG, slightly more complicated, and this is the one that I use for modeling. I've got catchment area and I've got ecoregion, both in there. And, and so you can see how line seven has changed, where I've got e catchment area is causing species richness, and so is ecoregion. Nothing about, oh, is there an interaction or anything like that? It's just, yeah, my, my vast knowledge as an ecologist says to me, catchment area has something, has some causal influence on species richness, and so does ecoregion. So if I go back, I'll, I'll erase this plot, and I'll run this DAG. And yeah, it's a bit more complicated because it's got two things pointing at species riches. And there's there's question one. There's 50% of lab four right there. Okay. Um, so we got line seven, which is basically specifying the components, the causal relationships in the DAG. All that line eight is doing that, that's like plotting position. So I got CA at position zero in the X direction and zero in the Y direction. I've got um, species richness at position one in X and Y direction. So you get the idea. All we're doing there is kind of designing what, what the picture looks like. So there's the... Um, there's the uh, results of the DAG scripts. Now let's, and, and I'm I'm just gonna, if, if there's something I say that's confusing, please just yell at me because I can't I can't see. Uh... Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So for that one, basically all we're doing is describing that relationship through that kind of yes rows, I guess. So which one's affecting which? And yes. then we're just talking about it in a paragraph? Yeah, you're just, and paragraph would be generous. So a couple, of, yeah, I'm saying that um, circularity of the blood uh, spatter is caused by uh, temperature and species of organism that was bleeding or something like that. Yeah, so it's really simple. It's very much... It, it can feed off of, remember lab one when I said, what's your conceptual model? Only you've just got, you've got two predictors and a response. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's actually do some modeling. So, um, uh, um, this one, I think. So you're going to do um, two really simple Bayesian fits. And, and um, the first one, and you know you can look back at the gory details of the lecture, but basically this is just, okay, I want to estimate species richness in this area. So in other words, I'm not using any predictors. I'm just... I just want to estimate it and estimate how much it varies from one stream to the next. What's the standard deviation of species richness? So let me run the script and then I'll go step by step through it. So I'm going to erase all the plots. And I'll tell you what's going on here. Because again, what you have to do, there's there's two things you're going to have to do. One is, obviously, this is going to be your data set. In this case, we're just talking about one quantitative variable. So the variable that was the target of your DAG, the response variable, in my case, it's species richness. And I'm going to go right back to the beginning of the plots this thing generated, because they look quite scary, especially that one. <laughs> Something. 
I'm gonna run that again. Hang on. There's something going on here. I'm sorry. Of course, this is happening. So let me like let me run one chunk at a time, and hopefully this. This, by the way, I'm not doing this on purpose. That would be too generous. But um, what I find with McElrace plotting functions and then um, the ggplot functions, sometimes you get this disconnect and a plot doesn't happen. That may not be the problem here, but um, if it does, I find sometimes clearing and then re rerunning works. But let's try that and see if I can solve it. Okay. so. Um, I'm doing the sim streams, rethinking, estimating species richness. And um, first few lines, you know, same old, same old. We got lines two to eight, which are just the, the packages that we're using. And then lines 10 to 14, loading the data set, the R data set, identifying which is going to be the quantitative variable. That's kind of going to be my target here. And um, the label on that quantitative variable from what if I labeled it back when I first entered the data. And then I just want to do a frequency. And this is the thing that's not working for whatever reason. Um, I, want to, I want to just do a simple frequency histogram of species richness. This is not any fancy Bayesian stuff. This is just me looking at stuff as I start the modeling process. There we go. And that, yeah, so that warning message I get there, that's, again, this kind of weird relationship between ggplot and McElrace um, functions that sometimes causes this. But so what you're looking at now is just the data. You know, it's just another way to look at it um, and just showing you frequency distribution frequency histogram, um, species richness on the x-axis, and, and different colored bars for the two ecoregions. Okay, so then um, lines 22 to 25 are just, you know, the same world that we've been comfortably in all this time. I just want to do a confidence interval and, and uh, an estimate of the standard deviation of species richness. So um, let's do that. And and that result is down in the console, right? Whenever you get text results, they're all just stuck down in the console. So there's the confidence interval on species richness. This is again, this is not by eco region or anything like that. This is just what's the average species richness of these streams? What's our 95% confidence interval? Well, the average is 70.6. And the 95% confidence interval, just kind of using lab two kind of logic or approach it's from anywhere from 69.1 to 72.1 and the standard deviation estimated standard deviation just calculated the same old way we always do is 23.3 okay so now we're going to get into um the bayesian stuff and this is where okay you've got to you got to come up with a, a kind of a proposal or so-called priors as to what the mean is of species richness and what the standard deviation is. And to do that, you know, you can see the way that I've done it for the mean in line 30 here is I'm thinking the means, you know, some somewhere between it's 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 probably about 80 and the standard error, the mean, you know, because imagine if I was resampling in that and what would the kind of variability in that mean be? Because what I'm trying to come up here uh, with is, uh, it's like a good guess, an a priori guess at what the mean is. So I just say, oh, well, 80 sounds like a reasonable guess. And we're going to see in a couple of minutes the difference between the reasonable guess. Like, there's no data involved yet, right? 
And then I'm going to see how that notion of what the mean might be changes when it's given exposure to the data. So we've got a guess of 80 for the mean. And, and uh, we've got a guess of somewhere between 0 and 40 for the standard deviation, how much one stream species richness varies to the next. So if I draw, I draw a picture of those, let me show you what the, those priors, as they call them, look like. So there's the prior for, for the standard deviation. It's a uniform distribution. It's somewhere between zero. I know it's bigger than zero because, you know, one stream is going to vary to the next. And I, I'm pretty sure it's smaller than 40. So that's my prior. And you know, people talk about narrow priors or broad priors. What they mean is, you know, how, how confident are you of your guess as to where the standard devi deviation is or where the mean is? So that's where line 30 and line 33 is where you're going to have to put in some kind of a reasonable guess. You're not, you know, you're not going to the wall for the guess, as I'm going to explain to you in a sec, but you, just a reasonable guess as to what the mean might be and what the standard deviation, the variability among individual observations might be. And this next couple of lines shows you you know what what bayesian fitting does is it tries out different combos of mean value and standard deviation value and it says okay um what's the likelihood of that combo given the actual data we have that's what the fitting thing is going to be in just a sec so let's look at the combos based on those priors that i've got in lines 30 33 Lines 35 to 38 are, okay, what combos is it going to be looking at? Is the Bayesian fitting going to be looking at to see which combo is more or less likely given the data that we actually collected? So here's a plot of them, which I know it looks totally weird right now, but let me just, give me a second to explain. I think it'll actually help you understand what the heck's going on, because this is obviously a kind of a different approach than than you probably used before. So what I meant by combos is think of every dot on that weird plot. You've got you've got the mu value, the mean proposed or prior mean value on the x-axis, and you've got prior sigma or standard deviation values on the y-axis. And every dot in that image there it's going to say, okay, what's the chance of that combo if given that we got the data we got? So it's kind of like, you know, our hypothesis thing turned on its ear, reverse. Because remember with hypothesis testing, we said, what are the chance of getting these data if the null, that one hypothesis, is true? In this case, we got an infinite number of those combos there, all those points there. I think there's 10,000 in that image. And it's saying, okay, with each of those dots, how likely is that combo given the data you got? That's, that's what we're going to do in fitting. And the fitting actually happens. Finally, the data are introduced in lines 40 to 53. So you see, this is where you define the model that we're fitting. So we got the response variable there species richness, and we've got the response variable we're proposing as a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. And the priors for mu, they're a mean of 80 with a standard error of the mean of 10, just what I had up in lines um, 30 and th uh, line 30 there. And then for the, the priors for the standard deviation, our uniform distribution somewhere between zero and 40. So that's where we've defined the Bayesian model we want to fit. And line 51, finally, our data has made an appearance. That's just the da data equals sim streams is the data set that I created. So that's where you're going to put the name of your data set. 
after you've said, okay, start with these priors. And we've got a picture of the priors in that plot over there in the bottom right corner. And with every combination of those, tell me how likely that combo is given the data that I actually collected. So what it's doing under the hood is amazing when you think about it. It's, it's literally saying, okay, we got 925 observations that I made in my data set, and it's gonna add up the likelihood of each of those hypotheses across all 925 observations. So it's gonna say, okay, this point is very unlikely. This, and I hope you can see my mouse pointing to one of those dots. Very unlikely. Uh, this combo in here, it's quite likely. You know, this combo of, of a certain standard deviation and a certain value for, for the mean. So that's what Bayesian fitting is. It's just saying, okay, we got uh, thousands and thousands of hypotheses. Tell us how likely each one is given the data set we collected. So I'm gonna fit that model. And the Precy line, line 53, is just kind of telling me how the model came out. And that's the exciting thing is those last two lines that you see in the console there. And all that's saying is that the mean, you know, the, the average likeliest value for the mean was 70.7. .7. And 5.5% um, of the values were below 69.4, and 5.5% uh, of the values were greater than 71.9. But the thing to keep in mind is that's not a confidence interval, okay? That's not an estimate of the mean as a parameter. It's, again, saying which were the most likely values when it, it looked at all those combos and which were the least likely. And it turns out to be very unlikely that the mean was less than 69.5 or greater than 71.9. And it's very unlikely that the standard deviation is less than 22.4 or greater than 24.1. So, you know, unfortunately, they're, they're spookily like confidence intervals on those parameters, but it's a totally different way. And, and you know, everybody's gonna rush back to see how similar the confidence intervals were to this. But um, what I want you to really keep in mind is that we got at this a different way by looking at the likelihood of all those hypotheses, finding the most likely hypotheses for both both the mean of the population and the standard deviation. A um, couple of other things to sort of uh, illustrate that. Here's, here's a plot of the posterior likelihoods of those two parameters. So we're looking at the priors right now in that plot that you see. Now let's run this one, you'll see the difference. So notice, and I'll just fold back to the, the first one. So look at the range on the x-axis there of mu values, goes from about 50 to 110. And the, the range, obviously, on the sigma side is 0 to 40, because we made it a uniform prior for, for the standard deviation. Here's, here's the posterior, so-called posterior likelihoods where you've got it honing in on, as that table in the lower left shows, honing in on a value between, looks like between 70 and 71, and honing in very much on a value for the standard deviation of about 23, in the area of 23. So, and, and again, this is based on what were the most likely combos given the data that we collected. So that's pretty cool. Final thing is kind of a picture comparison of the our prior notion of what species richness was and how it varied in the 
in the population among the streams. That's on the left. It says prior richness. And posterior richness is after the likelihood's been put up beside the actual data we collected. So you can see you've got a tighter distribution on the left versus the, on the right, or sorry, on the left, we've got um, you know the mean of 80, uh, standard deviation somewhere between 0 and 40 and so on. On the right, again, our, our notion of what the mean is, what the standard deviation is, has been flavored by the data. What's the most likely hypotheses? And that, that's what you're looking at there. Okay, so that's that's simple estimation. You know, once you run this, and again, what you have to do to, to do this is really just put in in your data set the one that quantitative response variable that was in your DAG. And you have to come up with a reasonable prior as to what the mean is, what the standard deviation is. And then you can do the model as I've shown you here, the Bayesian fitting as I've shown you here, and you get these results. Okay, so I'll just let that absorb for a sec. And everybody, I don't know if anybody tried the fitting while I was talking away and maybe saw whether it worked or not worked with my data or... Anyway, I'll I'll leave you to that. Um, so one more thing, and that's the fitting of the actual model with more than one predictor and the comparison of models. Because you know, even if we we're back in our old style hypothesis testing mode, we always, as scientists, you know, we build a model and we're always want to know: is this model, this more complicated model? worth it or should I simplify it? Should I get rid of this predictor and just have this more simple? And and oftentimes the way we do it is oh which of the which of the predictors are significant, you know, or should I get rid of them and you know, all that kind of thing. And this what I want to show you with this with this last model is um sort of the Bayesian approach to that because the, the limitations, which I hope you're starting to get, I don't expect you to become true, true believers from this. The limitations with the hypothesis testing approach is we've got two choices, right? Reject or not reject the null, whether we're talking about a t-test or one-way ANOVA or two-way ANOVA or multiple regression and a parameter or a predictor and a multiple regression. We're really talking about is it the null or not? And the thing I love about Bayesian, you know, I, do, I don't really listen to all the noise about what a philosophy or anything like that. It's more choices, you know. What's what's the likelihood of this versus that? Um, above and beyond just worrying about the null hypothesis being rejected or not. So if I go to the more complex model, um, not the DAG, there we go. So in this case, I'm going to use um, ecoregion. Remember, we've already looked at the data, and um, we've, we've seen that um, it looks, or just our eyeballing of the data is that, uh, there's a difference between the ecoregions and species richness, and there's an effective catchment area. So, so let's try to model that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna model it using the techniques we used in lab two. I'm just gonna go straight to the uh, the Bayesian fitting. So what I'll do again is run all this, and then I'll go back to the beginning and, and talk you through what I've done after I make sure it works. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Just a second. I just got to get rid of this Zoom thing.
Okay, so I'll go back to the this plot. And then the, the real action is down in the console where we're getting results. So make that a bit bigger. And uh, go back to the start of the, the script. Okay, so the first few lines are same. I'm just uh, I'm just getting the data set. And then um, because I'm using a, um, a quantitative predictor here, catchment area, or actually log catchment area, then I take the mean of that because just the way that the syntax works within the Bayesian fitting. So again, for you folks, you've got a quantitative predictor and a categorical predictor that that quantitative predictor is going to be you're going to substitute uh, for log underscore ca that's my quantitative predictor here and here's my first model which is simple it's almost as simple as the one we did in the previous script so you can sort of see the same model syntax where i've got this model that I'm going to call SPP underscore ecoregion. And here's the model where species, again, it's a normal distribution with um, mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. But mu, in this case, is not, remember last time I said mu, the priors were mean of 80 with standard error of the mean 10. In this case, the mean actually depends on an effect of ecoregion, or it depends on the ecoregion. So I have this parameter called a fit ecoregion. That means there's a separate, it's gonna find a separate value for each of the ecoregions that best fit the data. And my initial prior is the ecoregions are the same. So that's what this line 19 is doing and saying, for each value of ecoregion, remember there's two ecoregions, my prior is that they're mean 80 and they have a standard error of the mean of 20. And then my prior for the standard deviation, which is how much streams vary within each ecoregion, is uniform distribution of 0 to 50, so a little bit wider than that first one. Same kind of deal, though, where I'm, I put my data set in, sim streams, and it's looking at, in this case, I don't have a picture of it because the pictures get quite complicated, but it's looking at every combination of mean value for ecoregion one, mean value for ecoregion two, and value for standard deviation. It's looking at all those combinations and saying, given the data set we got, what's the likelihood of each of these thousands and thousands of combinations of the mean of eco region mean richness for eco region one mean eco uh, richness for eco region two and standard deviation so that's all piled into or packed into lines 15 to 23 so um we can see underneath here if you look at the console the the type the output in, in black shows you the Bayesian fit of that, of that model. And what it's saying is the most likely value for ecoregion one is somewhere between 38 and about just less than 40. And the most likely value of the mean richness for ecoregion two is somewhere between 85 and 86. Uh, and so, Given it checked out all those infinite number of combos, really, and it found that huge difference in the most likely values for richness in eco region one and two. Uh, standard deviation had honed in on uh, a much smaller value in this case. Remember, this is the same data, actual data. And now we're talking about the variability among streams within the ecoregions, and it's saying that value is somewhere between 7.3 and 7.9. Okay, so that's the fit of that model. 
Then we fit a slightly more complicated model where I add in, here's the, here's the second model where I've got ecoregion and catchment area and still have the same opening line. Species richness is got a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Mu is a fit ecoregion, same as in that previous um, model that we did. But now it's got plus B times log CA minus X bar, which is the mean of, of log catchment. So in other words, we've got a regression equation in here. That's how we've added that quantitative predictor of log catchment area. So now our Bayesian fitting, you know, imagine the combos it's going to be looking for now. All combinations of a mean value for each ego region and a slope, one slope value, which represents within an ecoregion, what's the effect of catchment area on species richness. So we've got a prior for the ecoregions, again, of 80, with standard error of the mean 20. We've got a prior for the slope of, and it's a log normal distribution. It's because, because we're talking about log catchment area, so our prior for the uh, for the slope value is one with a standard deviation of two, and our sigma value still is you know somewhere between zero and fifty. So just keep in mind again that, and and this this should kind of be core to your understanding of Bayesian fitting. All we're doing by establishing the priors, we're not telling the modeling what value to find. We're saying, check out all these combinations and tell us which are the more likely combinations given the data that we actually collected from those ecoregions, from those streams, from different catchment areas. Which are most likely of the hypotheses about the, the effect of ecoregion and catchment area on species richness? So we ran that model and got the results that you see now in the in the console there. So mean of each uh, ecoregion about the same as in the previous model, but the the value for B this is the slope relating species richness to the log of catchment area is likely to be somewhere between 6.3 and 6.9. So there's there's a pretty pretty decent slope on that relationship. And see how the sigma, the standard deviation, that's the amount of fuzz around that line with for each of the ecoregions has shrunk even more. So we're explaining more with our predictors and therefore reducing that unexplained variation that's in sigma in the standard deviation. Okay, final thing is we, we slightly complicate the model. I'll do it up top here. Just complicate it one more time. <laughs> and that is, we've got line 43, same old, same old. We got species richness, mu and sigma. But in this case, we've got line 44, a value for each ecoregion, and then an effect of catchment area that differs or potentially could differ in the ecoregions. So this is like having an interaction term in your multiple regression. It's saying the effect of catchment area might depend on which ecoregion you are you're in. And if you remember me saying when I showed you the the raw data or the raw simulated data, that I made it so that catchment area had a bigger effect on those lowland streams, the valley streams on richness than the highland streams. So I should find if my modeling technique works, I should find a different value of B for ecoregion one than I do for ecoregion two. 
So I've got priors as usual. This is kind of like a null hypothesis, although I don't like to confuse the two worlds. So our priors are the same mean for each ego region and the same slope relating species richness to catchment within each ego region. So if we look at the fit of the model down below here, we can see, you know, same value for mean of each eco region. And then the slope for eco region one is somewhere between 2.95 and 3.8. The slope for eco region two, the lowlands, is somewhere between 7.9 and 8.5. So again, it looks quite likely that those two slopes are different. They depend on which eco region you're in. So the very last thing we do is say, okay, which model do we pick? And, and if we were null hypothesis folks, we'd be looking at how did the R squared change um, and all, all that sort of stuff. So I won't, I won't bother to bore you with the theoretical basis of, of these um, diagnostics that we have here, but suffice to say, in looking at those, some of you will have experienced AIC, Akachi's information criterion. When you're looking at different models, you're trying to pick the one, we're always trying to pick a model that um, balances explaining variation in the response variable without overfitting, so-called. We don't want it to be just particular to the, the vagaries of whatever data we collected. So these diagnostics really do a good job of that. And what you look for is uh, the smallest possible deviance and the change in deviance as you go from a more complicated model, sorry, as you go from a simpler model to a more complicated model. You're looking for a big payoff in a, in a drop in deviance and to make it worthwhile, essentially, to have those additional parameters in the model. So all your the plot that you're looking at over on the right is just a picture of that table, or one aspect of that table. And you're seeing that the, the lowest, the, the SPP underscore eco region wake value, way up here at about 6,400, is much larger than the wake value, the deviance, when we have both eco region and catchment area in the model. So this is saying it's worth it to add catchment area to the model. It's only marginally better if we add that interaction. So two different parameters, two different slope values for catchment area, depending on which eco region we're in. So this is the kind of evidence I would use to say, okay, if I'm building the strongest, most robust model, for species richness as modeled with catchment area and ecoregion. I would certainly include both of them in the model, but I would just use the one slope value for catchment area for both of the ecoregions. So that middle model seems to do the best job of balancing predictive power, explanatory power, with not having uh, too many explanatory variables in there. So, and then the last plot is just, we, we've seen a version of it before where you're looking at catchment area on the x-axis and species richness on the, on the y-axis and then the two different ecoregions there. So basically your job, again, is you got the DAG for the first question. And then the second question is to take this model. I, I gave you the one with just fitting the variable, just so you get the idea of Bayesian fitting. But take this model where I'm modeling species richness from categorical ecoregion, quantitative catchment area, and getting that increasingly more complicated model. And then in the last piece, just comparing them and seeing what level of complexity it's, it's worth going to among the three. So 
have have a shot at it <laughs> and um I'm, I'm glad hopefully everybody's got scripts working now but uh, obviously if you get and i don't i don't know if every, anybody's had the opportunity to um to try the like actual modeling part as opposed to just the DAG. But um, when you do, if uh, if you run into trouble, uh, just get get in touch. And as Emily's asking, reshare the folder. Yeah, I'll I'll do the OneDrive sharing is a bit of a wild beast. So right after this, I'll go back and make sure that what's in there is accessible to everybody. I just don't have the scripts for lab four. I must have downloaded an earlier version because mine yeah. are all like EH model one. Yeah. Yeah. Is it the same or do I need okay, any so, ones? Well, I'll, what I'll do is I would, you know, you can you can delete those or keep them at, as you wish. I just when uh, I went through everything earlier in the week and, and just kind of made sure first of all, things were working and also you only, you got a sequence that kind of most efficiently got you to where, <laughs> where you have to go. There's a lot of extra stuff that was there. And so it's basically to avoid confusion. What I might do is, if I were you is download a call it like uh, lab four V2 folder or something like that. So you, you kind of, yeah, you have it separately. That's that would be my suggestion because you have you have to make sure within that lab four folder. I mean, we've all experienced, you know, getting the data from somewhere and all, all that sort of stuff. So it's all kind of the call to data and the writing of files is all kind of internal to that folder. Um but but yeah, I what I would do is maybe download this one when i when i reaccess it and call it something different on your hard drive within okay. your project thank you anything um, else on that yeah so for the presentations um, right. are we going to have access to the peer feedback form format before we have to present yes Okay, thank you. Yeah, next on my list, preparing all of us for next Wednesday. Awesome, thank you. Hey. Uh, just one more question for me. Uh, for the DAG, uh, where we have to choose two predictor variables, is it okay if it's two categorical variables or does it have to be one quantitative, one, one categorical? Yeah. I it has to be one categorical, one quantitative, because that way it matches that modeling. I don't I don't want you to otherwise you have to get into revising that modeling that I just did. The easiest thing for you to do. <laughs> and it the one of the beauties of Bayesian is you don't have to worry about kind of unbalanced and all that kind of stuff, but the easiest thing for you to do is find a categorical analog to ecoregion, quantitative analog to catchment area, and then a quantitative analog to species richness, and so that you can just substitute things into my my scripts. Okay, um, sounds good, thanks. Okay. All right, well, I'll leave you at that. And uh, again, um, yeah, Keep your eyes open. I'll put in. I'll put up a schedule, but also an evaluation uh, rubric for folks to use, and that I will use. Okay. I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.